Uh, hello, everybody. Today we are going to present a paper by Camille Sofon uh, about successful assessment of the economic impact of ecological transition policies in the EU. Uh, our presentation consists of uh, four sections. Uh, <coughs> Um, we start with summary, following application uh, of the models, then we will cover modeling critiques and uh, then conclusion. So we will also uh, give open questions uh, to speaker. If you want, you can f feel free to add your questions. Uh, well, uh, to start with, uh, we need to uh, address goal of this article, as uh, authors mentioned, goal of this article is to take stock of the economy, energy, environment models currently used by the European Commission and most specifically by Directorate General for Economic and Financial Affairs. And we also um, find two uh, aims uh, that provided by the author, which is quite appealing. <coughs> it's providing a detailed uh, list of the challenges faced by these models in the light of the ecological transition and presenting all of the existing theoretical and operational uh, complement complements uh, and alternatives to these models. Uh, as already we saw, there are two types of models, DSG and SGE. Um, each institution generally develops its own variation of these models and authors therefore attempt to refer both to the historical colonial models and to the models currently in use. And in terms of DSG model, agents, agents make decisions based on their expectations about the future and the decisions influence macroeconomics and other factors. And also SGA models are economic models used to simulate the impact of change in economic policy, technology and other um, specific sectors. Sector, these models examine how supply and demand interact in different markets to determine prices and uh, quantities of service in the market and good, good. Uh, the aim of the work uh, is not to highlight doctoral opposition, but rather to objectify elements that have a direct impact on modeling results. And also there are uh, 11 challenges that addressed uh, by analyzing nine models uh, due to Two first points of criticism, uh, namely <coughs> output gap framework, equilibrium framework, uh, are intrinsic to the optimization equilibrium framework of models, and the two following critics uh, say real economic model and neutrality and exogenity of money. Uh, made stem from the limited treatment of the monetary and financial systems in the model and uh, two critiques which haven't been addressed yet are the ones of the damage function and feedback of the energy and resource as production constraints. Well, also uh, there is appealing part is that uh, mod, uh, authors address need for uh, economic models that address macroeconomic purposes separately because there are so many complex and co uh, variety of uh, elements and aspects that address and affect ecological shift and every issue should be addressed uh, with specific methodology and with deep consideration. This paper uh, therefore strongly argues for diversification, diversification of the model classes uh, used and of the assumption to the benefit from the specificities and comparative advantages of each classes. Uh, this calls for interdisciplinary dialogue involving not only economics but uh, many other disciplines. It also requires dialogue between modeling research teams, teams uh, all eco academic, uh, institution, public, private uh, and agencies. Such dialogue would ideally not just be in the sharing of model but also in the construction of the models themselves. So now we're going to the second part of our presentation uh, about the application of the models. Uh, the author highlighted a few models that are being developed in some institutions and we looked up a bit to see how they are being ap applied in the like in these institutions. So TCFD and IMF has a series of technical papers there using the IREN model to countries such as Barbados and Indonesia. ECLAC is doing E3ME to Brazil and Chile. AFD is using Colombia, uh, the Colombia case to apply the GEMS model, as we've seen in the former. We had a seminar on that with Antoine Godin. So what are the differences of these models when applying this uh, in comparison to a mainstream uh, 
econometric model. So that, for example, if we get the gems for Colombia, I'm going to be really quick because we're already seeing that. <laughs> is we have Colombia, it's really dependent on primary goods and it's going to be really affected by climate change. So the outcomes of the model is worsening the balance of payments, lower growth rates, uh, transitory uh, inflation, and higher unemployment. Uh, as we've seen also like in the past, uh, the government of Colombia is trying to pursue this uh, decarbonization path and maybe implying a structural change in the economy to adapt to the climate change uh, scenario. Uh, what I'm going also to talk a little bit more about the iron in Barbados because it's a different case. So similarly to Colombia, we have high dependence on another commodity, in this case it's oil for energy. It, it's imported, it's really complicated for the country. They are really exposed to climate physical risk and they depend on tourism. And that's a really uh, interesting point because 37% of the jobs of the island depends on tourism. And tourism <coughs> is what they call in the paper as a spillover effects of the transition because Barbados, the other countries' actions to fight climate change <laughs> will affect the Barbados economy. Because if you reduce, for example, fuel subsi subsidies, uh, less people are going to go to Barbados and the country is going to be really uh, in a tough situation. So the outcomes, uh, basically, uh, the authors, uh, Monasterolo and Godel, they say they have lots of different scenarios uh, below two Celsius degrees, uh, net zero, uh, for rider if the country doesn't do anything for climate change. But what we can say is that they are going to be really affected by climate change in all scenarios. Uh, but it's higher, it's harder for them uh, in the net zero scenario because of the spillover since they didn't adapt themselves to climate change. So the recommendation is to be uh, try to make their economy more robust with regard to the possible decrease in tourist flows. What does it mean? Uh, maybe we have to uh, diversify the economy, the same outcome as for Colombia. Uh, so what we have in this uh, different, uh, different models we're using here is that they have different outcomes for different scenarios and all their conclusions, they contradict the mainstream assumption. Uh, they don't have natural levels of employment or output or inflation. So <coughs> the models can predict transitory inflation, for example, or really not decreasing of output or crisis. So that's something that the mainstream uh, models may not predict because they work with this uh, idea of natural employment and the natural, everything's going to flow to the natural levels, everything's just transitory. So it's quite hard for a policymaker to believe that everything's going to be the same after a crisis. We have hysteresis, we learned with uh, <laughs> Daniel <laughs> this week, <laughs> last week. So, and they also advocate for the development of a more robust economy, which implies in the diversification, uh, diversification of the economic activity towards resilient, towards like negative shocks. Uh, in this context of climate change, it's important to be resilient to fiscal and transition risks. So if you have, your productive capacity, all, all focus in the production of oil, you're going to have a problem uh, with the transition and also the fiscal risk of climate change may affect you as we've seen with the other the countries we were talking about. So maybe in the past, some Latin Americans would have said that a a, would suggest a structuralist approach to di diversify the economy of the country, to have more resilience toward negative shocks. But like in the 30s, the problem was external, <laughs> external commerce. You have to have the control of your balance of payments. And now another risk is posing to, to these economies. It's climate change. It's a new source of vulnerability. So, thank you. Um, so now, just before the, the modeling critiques, um, I would like to we would like to highlight um, another um, potential model that could be added to uh, the models that were presented in the paper, uh, that are financial and macro network models. So that these models um, try to um, analyze the connections uh, between different levels, uh, like micro and uh, macro levels, and also the feedback between uh, all uh, institutions and. Um, agents. So financial network models allow to understand how externalities move along chains of financial con contracts, how it can create also systemic risk, uh, in particular in the presence of imperfect information and uh, incomplete, incomplete uh, risk markets. 
So, for example, in a study um, by Monastery Law and All in 2019, um, they used a financial macro network approach to analyze uh, the impact of climate policy shocks on the financial system. And they analyzed the financial interdependency and feedback loops between uh, the financial sector and the real economy. Uh, so, um, we want also to present some critics of uh, modeling in general. So, um, a first limit that could be raised is uh, regarding uh, biodiversity related financial risk, as they are more complex to estimate in financial terms than climate related financial risk. Uh, they encompass uh, indeed multiple phenomena and complex system dynamics. Therefore, the quantitative estimations would require um, multiple indicators and this pose uh, a challenge for financial risk modeling. Also, uh, this biodiversity related financial risks um, uh, may undermine economic and financial stability within a much uh, shorter time than uh, climate related physical risks. Uh, so, as they can materialize before uh, scenario modeling becomes operational, um, uh, this um, biodiversity loss and its uh, socio-economic consequences would be subject to radical uncertainty where uh, future outcomes are inherently unknowable. Therefore, there could be two main challenges uh, for this biodiversity-related biodiversity financial risk. Uh, the first one is to include uh, really complex indicators in uh, the models. And the second one uh, would be uh, um, the already existing impacts and cascading effects of this uh, biodiversity risk. Um, and um, another limitation is regarding the policies implementation because policymakers and financial authorities face a trade off between knowledge building. Uh, through modeling and policy actions. Therefore, the pursuit of uh, even more perfect information cannot be a prerequisite to taking policy actions under condition, conditions of radical uncertainty. Uh, so, quantitative approach alone would not be uh, sufficient to ensure effective risk management, and um, it would be uh, therefore uh, better or at least uh, complementary, to balance this knowledge building uh, and uh, adding to this policy action under current available information. So some authors also um, raised uh, the importance to take precautionary and proactive approach to monetary policy. Um, the, as the policy approach of wait until we have a better understanding currently fails to justify and compensate for the potentially catastrophic and irreversible effects of delay. Um, so, uh, therefore, this um, raised the importance of a more qualitative approach using experience rather than data. Uh, as um, advocated by Chenet and all in 2021, they uh, advocate for a macro prudential policy approach that favors uh, precautionary but active policies that avoid uh, large losses scenarios regardless of the likelihood of any given scenario. And uh, Svartsmal and all in 2021 also call for a proactive role of central banks in climate policy coordination beyond the adoption of scenario based analysis. So, once, once again, I bring, bring new another structuralist uh, economist to to the topic here. Uh, when we talk about uh, Barbados and, for example, uh, and Colombia, uh, the problem is they are developing countries, but they can act as uh, a model for what other countries can do. Because for years, these countries have been facing problems with structural change, and they need to do that. And now, with climate change, it is required to all the world do to do a structural change in the in their economies to cope with to fight what we're being through so the thing is uh, economic science is always uh, pledged as to be really accurate on the methods uh, but this problem is like we have this tendency of putting numbers in everything and when you have numbers it's accurate <laughs> but we forget that economics is a social science so we are studying the same object as we are. So we're studying humans and we are still humans. So that's what Celso Furtado would say in 1974 already. Uh, and what happens is that any analysis is going to be influenced by your initial vision. And it reflects the social structure and relations of power. And that's maybe the main problem of 
relying on just models and numbers to forecast or predict any uh, any policy making initiative because all the assumptions are going to reflect any uh, economic paradigm even though it's claimed to be neutral or pragmatic or anything that's not really related to a dogmatic or ideologic uh, situation. So for our questions, <laughs> we are going to, we have a few here. Uh, it's related to what I've said before. It's like, how is it possible to separate the theoretical and the ideological bias from the application of models? First of all, uh, for a government to use these models to do a policy making, they have to accept this ideological bias. They have to accept that their country maybe is not going to grow considering the, the current situation of climate change. It's going to face a crisis inevitably. Uh, another problem is uh, how is this, if these alternative models also imply and change in the paradigm of the policy making approach, if the governments are going to use a more active role in development to promote the structure change climate, uh, climate change <laughs> requires. And Camille has more questions. <laughs> Uh, so one question would be how to implement interdisciplinary <coughs> dialogue as it was mentioned in the paper because um, uh, other so so social sciences also use uh, more qualitative works and not uh, quanti quantitative works. And uh, how can we make economic models accessible to the people without creating a contradiction between the use of increasingly complex models and uh, the need to enhance political participation in the decision making process? Uh, how, how challenging it would be to implement such models considering regional characteristics within EU because we're not talking about developed, developing or underdeveloped countries. It's within EU because uh, there is regional difference and, and diversity between EU considering like Eastern Europe and Western <coughs> Europe and models also should consider uh, such diversity and address the uh, and also yet um, models try to slightly address <coughs> technological aspect while existing innovation and technologies contribute to biodiversity. Why models fail to consider technological dimension adequately? Thank you very much, girls. Now you have around 10 minutes okay. to <laughs> answer these questions. And Perfect. after we're going to open the floor for everyone. Awesome. <laughs> so, uh, actually it was a really good compliment. So uh, thank you very, very much for this uh, discussion because you, you show that in fact, lots of those proposed models have been used already concretely out of the labs at the service of uh, either states and governments or international institutions, but also local communities, uh, local governments, regional governments, etc. Including uh, underdeveloped and developing countries because we, we forgot a lot uh, usually, especially for example when we talk about degrowth, about the global asymmetries and the global south. For example, uh, uh, in a former paper, uh, I've run a panel uh, structural VAR to show that, uh, in fact, the, in fact, the idea is that imagine that the global north does, uh, does his uh, energy transition unilaterally. All the global south countries which are relying on fossil fuel exports in terms of reserves, in terms of uh, uh, foreign exchange reserves, fiscal revenues, GDP, etc., will have a huge uh, collapse in terms of uh, in terms of all those dimensions. So. And we, we, we had uh, the example of the COVID shock. The COVID shock with uh, like a negative shock in terms of uh, Western demand for oil and fossil fuels uh, due to the lockdown, etc., which led to like uh, negative consequences in uh, underdeveloped countries. So about the question, I'll just could you clarify why there would be a trade-off between knowledge building and policy making? It's in, it's in terms of time? Yeah, I mean, if you, in France, we have something which is beautiful, which is called the CNRS, the National Center for uh, Scientific Research, which is like, a, like thousands and thousands of the highest level researchers which are public, who are public servants and who are paid in order to do whatever they want. For example, if we orientate those research on uh, data collection, econometric estimation and forecasting and modeling, 
Uh, I mean, in six months, with lots of research assistants and uh, PhD students and master students really well paid with their names put on the papers, I think, you know, this trade-off is really decreased in terms of uh, opportunity cost. So, uh, but I, 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 see, I see your point. So, about this, oh, how, how is it possible to separate the theoretical and ideological bias from the applications uh, of a model? Uh, it is not, my opinion. <laughs> Except for some cases where, uh, why am I defending reali uh, realism in, in modeling? It's because uh, it's more transparent in terms of uh, uh, um, like hidden axioms, etc. Uh, it's more tractable in terms of causality, but also because usually it's more robust. No, in terms of epistemology, it's interesting to see that usually. Models that are realistic are more robust to models that are unrealistic. Maybe there is something, you know, really deep into epistemological uh, conceptualization of the, the realm uh, of reality that can uh, explain that. But of course, my point is to say all models have assumptions, so we need to be transparent about those assumptions and those axioms. And two, some models, some assumptions are true. Some assumptions are wrong. So I'm also calling to, I, I, mean, I mean, that's the point of the paper of Olivier Blanchard, 2016, do DSGE models have a future? He says that in DSGE model, you have three equations. Uh, mainly you have the price equation, which is a kind of Phillips curve, supply stuff. You have the aggregate demand and you have the Taylor's rule for monetary policy. At least the, the first two, they are at the opposite of the empirical knowledge about the behaviors of those agents both at the micro and macro level. So it's not about, yes, there are diverse assumptions with diverse political, uh, economy, ideologies behind. And it's just, it's just wrong. It's just, they are not true. So of course, then you can define what are the hypotheses that are robust and what are the, what are the hypotheses on which we cannot have lots of knowledge. And we make a transparent choice about, uh, uh, about this in terms of political economy. Just a few words, in, which, is, uh, which is linked to, to everything here. I'm working on a new paper with a colleague at the Ecole Normale Supérieure, uh, Félix Ranson, uh, to, to take, in fact, uh, the example of climate sciences, another international research community. In fact, what, uh, what are they doing? You know, the biggest climate models, the, uh, which are called the GCM, the, uh, the General Circulation Models, they are huge, huge, enormous models. I mean, like sometimes 500,000 equations, millions of parameters, like Navier-Stokes equations, so partial, de, uh, PD, P, PD, yeah, partial, uh, partial derivative equations, uh, discretized uh, at least, but I mean, they are huge, enormous, complex. You, you need a, a whole server in a whole room, like between weeks and months to have one run, one simulation. You cannot use Python on your, on, on your uh, computers. They are still, they, they still have far better practices than economists. So there is an international organization since 90, uh, 1979, which is the coupled model intercomparison uh, program under the, the dire direction of the uh, World Meteorological Association, which take all the research team with all climate models and which are one, two steps, one, standardizing the database in order to avoid a, a, a cherry picking in econometric estimation, calibration, etc., so that everyone have good, reliable, and the same database, and then to compare the models, equation by equation, parameter by parameter, functional form, robustness, forecasting, uh, descriptive, uh, descriptive ability of past uh, uh, data, etc. There is an international organization that is doing that with all climate models in the world with models far more complex than DSGEs or post keynesian models or whatever uh, you want. Why are we not doing that? Even among heterodox, it doesn't even exist be between heterodox, between Steve Keen uh, in Australia, Gael Giro in France, uh, in France, uh, Dafermos in the UK, etc. So, so other, research, other research fields have good practices and we need to, to take some examples of them. And it's linked to interdisciplinary, how to implement interdisciplinary dialogue to talk to researchers of other fields. It seems to be crazy, but uh, I, I work with uh, lawyers about, uh, I, I, I work, uh, I, I mean, a legal theory, a theoretician, 
Uh, I work with psychologists, we work with a physi uh, physician and a thermodynamician, uh, we work with sociologists in the research team where I have, uh, which is led by, by Gail Giro at Georgetown University. Uh, you just need to talk, just need to talk and to go out of even the heterodox uh, economist world, etc., just to talk, to share ideas, and you can build laboratories and the, the environmental justice program, for example, at Georgetown University in Washington, is something like that. There are economists, but also sociologists, psy psychologists, philosophers about ethics, about uh, uh, ethics, political theorists, uh, biologists, uh, climate scientists, etc. So just building that kind of in interdisciplinary. Is the use of these alternative models and change in the paradigm of the current policymaking approach? Ah, oh, okay, I see the... Um, Yes, it can. Yes, it is. I mean, uh, for example, and it's connected also to, yeah, uh, we are putting numbers everywhere. Maybe we, we should stop doing modeling because it, it leads to, uh, to austerity, etc. In fact, uh, uh, if you want to transform reality at the global level, while still being fair and stable in terms of macroeconomics, maybe you want some good maps. Because even radical uncertainty, you can, you, can, you, you can take a trajectory and you can just send shocks. For example, that's the Weizmann, the Weizmann approach uh, with, uh, with the fat tails uh, catastro uh, climate, uh, climate catastrophe. You, you take a, fa a fat tails distribution and you say, OK, global warming will trigger lots. And is already triggering lots of uh, catastrophes. So you just put random shocks. You don't say that there will be uh, a tornado or uh, a starvation here or here next year. But you just say, Future will be uncertain, there will be big catastrophes, so let's do like if there was things that will happen to see if we are robust. Not forecasting the shocks, but just saying random shocks to say, to make like, to, to pretend, to pretend uh, th there will be catastrophes. And uh, of course it depends on the, vo the voluntarism of the public institution with who you work. I mean, in my case with Gail Giro, we, we worked um, we, we, we've worked with uh, the South, uh, South African government, Central Bank, and National Treasury. We will start to work with uh, Gustavo Petro, the government uh, in uh, co Colombia. Uh, uh, Gail Giro worked with, uh, with lots of countries in the, in the... I mean, when you are, for example, of Gustavo Petro, a left-wing government who, uh, who, uh, who, who got elected, maybe you want some map in order to avoid capital flight, to avoid the inner uh, uh, like financial counter revolution uh, uh, that you will suffer, etc. So, uh, in my opinion, it's not oh we have too much numbers. It's we have wrong models. And if you look at Goodwin models and stuff like that, in fact, they are far more complex than neoclassical models that are only on uh, Lagrangian. So it's not you, we are using uh, uh, too much math. No, we are we are using uh, uh, bad math. We are using stuff that we are doing in bachelor in order to say, oh, look at, I'm doing mathematics, so it's a technical science, it's not a social science, and you shouldn't, as a citizen, say, oh, maybe austerity, austerity is bad because all my family is unemployed. No. So, of course, we need more of two. We don't need less math. We need better math, like really better math, to have endogenous structuration, etc., really better model, and much more democratic processes and sociological studies and political studies on the impact of that kind of stuff. So we need more interdisciplinarity, more math, more interdisciplinarity in social sciences. And for example, about democracy, how can we, how can we, uh, yeah, how can we integrate citizens? How can we make economic models accessible to the people without creating a contradiction, etc.? So first example, the Locomotion Project is create, uh, currently building a user-friendly site which is like, a, like a, an interface simple enough so that everyone can use it. So you take, oh, oh there is uh, such trajectories. If I put a carbon tax, you can do, uh, you will be able to do this on, your, uh, on the internet, and it will be uh, open to everyone. So every citizen can, uh, can, can, can do that. For example, with Gael Giro and Nicolas, uh, Nicolas Dufresne at the Institute Rousseau two years ago, we, we've proposed the ABC tax. It's about fisc uh, fiscal reforms. You know, uh, fiscality is really complex. No one uh, understands the marginal rates, the progressive rates, etc. You can just reform. Chalk. Yes, here. 
we made a proposal which have in fact already be, be made by a, a Swedish economist Gustav Kassel in 1901 and 1903, the ABC tax. You, 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 you reform the whole fiscal system of every country, of every dimension, income, capital income, etc., benefits, with three parameters. Uh, let's say A is a marginal tax rate, so the, the tax rate for really the, the, the richest people. B, B is the minimum income below which you won't be taxed. And C is the convexity or concavity parameter. And with only three parameters, you can reproduce the exact amount of fiscal revenues you want. You can change everything. And you can have a national debate with all the citizens involved about it's, it would be a really simple debate, democratic debate. We have to decide about three parameters and the result. Let, and everyone in society, everyone can debate about those three, can understand the debate about those three parameters. So, of course, in order to have, uh, to have an impact, you need to work with governments who really want to lead an ecological transition, which is so socially fair. Of course, if those models are used by institutions that don't want to because of political interest, they won't use it. Or they will use it in a distorted way in order to have uh, other results. But I'm talking about building models for governments who want to have an impact. And that's why we are do, uh, working with uh, South Africa, Colombia, etc. And finally, uh, while existing innovation and technology, ah, ju just uh, about democracy also, I think about this. You know, in the integrated assessment model, the IAMs, you have the, dis the famous social discounting. You know, the social discount rate. Have you, have you seen that? That's a really core idea, which, which is coming from capitalization, so the invention of capitalism by uh, Italian bankers in the 14th, 15th century, etc. Uh, that's the idea that future have less value than today. So we care less about future generations than our ourselves. And when those models are used to say the social cost of carbon should be this, and we will do, we will do a carbon tax with this. They are, use, uh, they are using a discount rate. Let's say beta equal uh, gamma plus g. This formula, Nordos formula, Ramsey's formula, uh, 1928, that's really simple. The, the rate of the decrease in the value of the future is like a normative rate, which is uh, the preference for the present, which is really normative, is that, that's arbitrary, can be an ethical discussion, etc. But whatever, let's say it's zero. And the, the expected growth rate of the economy multiplied by the marginal uh, utility of consumption change. We, wh what does it mean, in fact, Delta? It's the, uh, the aversion to intergenerational inequalities. What does it say? It says that if I suppose that future generations will be richer than me because the, uh, the, rate, the growth rate will be positive, in fact, I care even more about the present and I don't care about ecological damages of the future because at least they will be richer. In a normative way, of course, it can be questioned. I totally question that. And in fact, you can even twist the thing by being, uh, if there are environmental catastrophes, in fact, a G will be negative because everything will buff. It will be a force to degrowth. And in fact, you will prefer the future than now because the future will be poorer. But another solution to that, that's the way of Stiglitz, of Appendix, etc., is to say, in fact, we don't even care. Why doing that? Why, why not just doing a model by saying we want this uh, emission and uh, we want those uh, objectives in terms of development, inequalities, etc. We know that uh, uh, in climate sciences, we know that if we have that kind of emission, we will have those damages. We have the result. And then let's have a political discussion between public policymakers or a democratic discussion among all citizens in order to say what trajectories we want to choose. You don't need that. That it's a normative statement. In fact, you can put citizen instead of this equation in the model. That's an example. Yes? OK. And to finish, while existing innovation and technologies contribute to biodiversity, why models fail to consider technological dimension adequately? Ah, I, oh, OK, I see the question. Two, two answers. First, uh, in fact, we talked about, uh, we, we talk about biodiversity in uh, Appendix B of the paper and the criticism on dimensions, which is the idea, in fact, that usually even models that are 
pulling the negative feedbacks of environmental damages on the economy, and not only the economy on nature, they only put like the effect of global warming. So rise in the level of oceans, uh, uh, decrease in agricultural uh, land yield, etc. But we have lots of other, it's a po ecological polycrisis. We have the collapse of biodiversity. We have, uh, e e at, the end, uh, at the end of the century, we, uh, some, uh, some medical literature review says that maybe the, the carbon, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere indoor will be so high that in fact we will lose some uh, of our cognitive abilities. Why not pulling that in terms of damages? So, uh, like, there are some really big uh, integrated assessment models that are uh, building lots of beautiful damage functions with lots of dimensions, biodiversity, zoonosis, uh, tropical diseases linked to uh, temperature, etc. Like the PAGE model or the FUND model, which are the two main ones. The issue with um, uh, damage functions is that we want to estimate a function about some things that never happened in history, human history. Or some people, like Burke, uh, are trying to do that by uh, doing a symmetrical damage function with the uh, 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 ice, uh, ice in air glacier. The freezing era, like a few thousand years ago, yeah? Ice age, yeah, literally, <laughs> of course. Like ice age, uh, and saying that it's ergodic, so it's symmetric, I don't believe that kind of shit. But, uh, that's the way. So uh, another thing you talked about uncertainty, we can say, let's have diverse uh, damage functions in order to have all the possible scenarios, like about uncertainty, uh, just, uh, uh, just uh, let, let, instead of pulling a parameter in the model, let's put a distribution of parameters so that you have all the extremes, all the possibilities, and you can compare. Just let's compare in the models, let's compare between the models, let's compare between the research teams. And uh, wh what do we fail to, to, to consider technological dimension adequately? Ah, uh, because there is a tradition of having either an exogenous uh, technological progress or to say that in fact humankind, uh, we are so optimistic about humankind that humankind will necessarily find the good technological uh, innovation. So in the DICE uh, model of Nordos, in fact, uh, technological progress is the result of increase in temperature because we find obviously solutions. But it's uh, yeah, it's linked, it's linked to also also to the interest of uh, researchers. I mean, uh, yeah, uh, th that could be a, a whole uh, research program about uh, uh, building uh, damage function for biodiversity as a link with technological innovation and maybe the negative side effects of green technological innovation, for example, uh, on, uh, on carbon, for example, carbon sinking, artificial carbon sinking, maybe it has negative uh, side effects on other dimensions like biodiversity. So we need to take that into consideration to, to see the good trade-off and to make the good trade-offs that at the end of the day should be made democratically by, by the citizen helped by the models and not the other way around, even with big math. That was my answer. <coughs> Any questions? <laughs> what time is it? Wow. Um, it hello. Let's take okay. a full round. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this is Pranandita. I'm from India. I have a very fundamental question. So in the DSGEs, those are micro foundation based models but they incorporate bounded rationality and stochastic agent behavior. So how are they epistemically different from agent-based models? Because agent-based models also you know, do the same thing. Okay. Let's, yeah, let's do around that. Yeah. Thank, uh, what a presentation, honestly. Yeah, yeah. what a presentation. Is it so positive the, or negative? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, I mean, it, it's... <laughs> Why not both? <laughs> no, no, it's a great compliment because I really missed my undergraduate school with these formulas, etc., which simplifies the life and the reality. Thank you very much for that. But my question is I was trying to somehow collect everything you were saying. Uh, uh, and the question is you told that the economy has been growing, so we have rising GDP, but we do not have. Uh, so when you look at the data, we you, so and you you touched upon the um, like generational wealth, like our future generation are getting wealthier, but it's not actually shown in the data. 
So when you look at the labor data, you see the wage has been decreasing over like 40 years since 1970s, let's say. And it's to, due to, as you mentioned, due to the austerity Oster, Oster, Oster approach that the government, due to the fiscal policies they have. And could you please comment on that as well? So you have growth in GDP, you have decrease in payment, um, and then the uh, decrease in productivity, and etc. And any policy recommendations for the future to tackle, tackle it? Because this is a great issue in, in European Union, well, while you consider 32 countries, like in developed, developed economies. So thank you. Okay. I hope it's clear. Yeah, OK. Yeah, uh, maybe one more, and then a second round, if you want to. I'm swallowing something, just a moment. <laughs> no, no worries. Hello, my name, my name is Gabriel from Brazil, and I have two questions. The first one is I, I, one thing about this, all these models uh, that you presented. Um, do, do, do their variability of results hinges on, for example, a very specific function uh, for, um, functions of investment, for example, because mm. there is a lot of debate within post keynesian literature on how investments are determined. I especially have a soft spot for the Zraffian super multiplier, which is an exogenous uh, uh, view. So maybe it would, would fall in the first category as a not resilient critique to equilibrium models. And the second one, uh, these models, they mostly have about uh, CO2 emissions, but what about the other global frontiers like biodiversity, uh, phosphorus limits, and other biophysical processes that we have already are reaching alarming levels, if they can cope with those kind of challenges, and what is the prospects for that? Okay, M maybe a uh, first one and then a uh, then second one. So thank you for this really, uh, I mean, relevant question. Uh, maybe about general wealth, uh, generational wealth. As I say, in fact, that's the normative approach of social discounting since Ramsey 1928, is to say that in fact, yeah, future have less value because future will be richer. So in a way, it says that it will compensate for the bigger environmental damages that, uh, you know, our grand, grand, grandchildren will suffer. Uh, of course, uh, in fact, there, and as I said, there is two ways to answer this. Either you say, in fact, I don't want a normative part such as that in my model. I want tra diverse trajectories under diverse assumptions and conditions. And then I want to decide collectively, either by the elected government or uh, as a society as a whole with citizens, which one to choose. So to have the normative a a approach in the society with uh, like uh, that kind of model. or. You can twist the, the thing that, that was the, the, the work of, uh, of Weizmann uh, before he, he, he sadly died uh, without the Nobel Prize, unfortunately. Uh, the idea to say, in fact, there are the hypothesis of having negative growth in the next decades because of a suffered degrowth, a forced degrowth, not a desirable or planned degrowth, but really a forced degrowth, is more, more and more uh, plausible. And that, that's the point of damage functions. Le, uh, uh, the issue is that that kind of model are coupled with damage functions. So, so there is a cycle. There is the impact of the economy, the economic activity on GHG emission and then on nitro destruction. And then you have the damage function, which is the feedback. Okay, there is an impact of nature, but the uh, uh, environmental damages will will impact also the economy. And it's already happening with forest fire, with decrease in agricultural uh, uh, land uh, yield, uh, with uh, a drought, uh, with the rise in sea levels, etc. With the decreasing in heroes, the, the, our ability to extract energy or uh, physical materials with the same amount of energy, etc. And in fact, yeah, uh, G can be negative. Uh, and so we, we should uh, act uh, right now, especially because Nordos, Nordos damage function, for example, says that the, the, the worst scenario, the RCP uh, 8.5 of the IPCC, plus 5 degrees at the end of the century, it will only decrease the global GDP of 5-6%. Okay. Let, let's say max 10%. Other people, like Dietz and Stern, Lord Stern from the, the Stern Review, from the, the UK House of Lords, say, no, it will be less, 4, uh, less uh, 90% of GDP. Because at plus five degrees, everything will burn, so the, the big Y disappears. 
And also because another reason is that Nordos is, all, is only saying that environmental damage impact Y, impact the GDP. But it, it will not impact the, only the GDP, it will impact K to impact the capital. So it's not only the yearly output which will decrease, but our ability to produce because factories will burn, uh, ag agricultural lands will disappear, etc. So absolutely, it's, it's really, I mean, a plausible hypothesis. And about the inequalities, uh, in fact, the GDP, the real GDP might increase, while the, distribution, the, factor, the, the factor distribution of the GDP might change. So, and that's the point of the Goodwin model. You know, the Goodwin model, the class struggle model, which is my favorite model, uh, which is the base, in fact, the, the basis for James. Uh, oh, no, let, let, not, let me do that, but you know, why you can divide it between wages, profit. So the income for uh, uh, labor, the income for capital. The Calder fact, if you remember the, the famous Calder fact, it says that it's con constant. It's not. And uh, more specifically, since the 80s and the neoliberal international uh, counter-revolution, in the, in the 90s, it was about 66% for the OECD countries, 66% of national income, which were for, uh, for labor. No, it's 61. Linked also to the flattening of the Phillips curve, so people, workers have less and less bargaining powers, uh, the union, workers' unions are le less and less uh, strong, etc. So it, it's not only about the growth rate, it's about the distribution of output and income between the different, uh, the different uh, you know, classes in, uh, in the economy. Whatever, whatever your political orientation, I mean, I say it like a positivist uh, fact, and after you, you do whatever you want. But indeed, there are an increase, a tendential increase of, uh, of, uh, of the income who, who, who goes to, to labor, uh, no, to, to profit. And you can even look at the profit and say that there is another split, which is a bigger and bigger part of profit is going into dividend and not into internal investment. So you also see the investment rates uh, like uh, being quite small. So uh, quickly about uh, micro foundation. Um, in fact, new classical models, micro, new classical micro funding models are not micro funded because a representative agent is not a micro foundation. You cannot aggregate the behaviors under a representative agents. Even that's really general equilibrium theory. But even if the individual preferences uh, are under government form. Even if you put really specific distribution on the uh, initial endowment or preferences of the, like in the Haro de Breu uh, model with production or exchange, you cannot aggregate this. If there is a beautiful paper epistemologically and uh, without math, if you want to read it, which is uh, the pap uh, paper from Alan Kierman, who is a great mathematician for Alan Kierman 1992. In a few weeks, uh, we will make a, post a podcast with him, so I will send you the, uh, about this if you, if you want. But uh, they are not micro-funded. ABM models are really micro-funded, so we really decentralized agents whose behavior can change. Because in a, in a, in a, even in a DSG with heterogeneous agents, the heterogeneity, in fact, is really small. They are not diverse agents that can really change through learning process with new information, which will interact together with some emergence properties, etc. Uh, like uh, thousands or even millions of agents. Usually they are two, or maybe more in Hank model, like in tank model they are two. They are still one like perfect foresight agent, and one who has liquidity constraints. It's a hand-to-mouth agent, which means that he he's not able to smooth his intertemporal consumption math because he cannot borrow against the future income. So he is just forced to have a Keynesian behavior, which means to consume what he earned today. But uh, that's really, you know, that's... One is closed form, the other is not. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And that's not really what I would call heterogeneity or, or complex, complex networks, complex systems, etc. And finally, about, uh, of course, the oversensitivity of those models to our... One thing, if you are doing models, especially if you are doing models for uh, André Lorenz or stuff at the end of the, the year in your essays, please do sensitivity analysis and bifurcation analysis. What does it say? That Oh, I, I write a beautiful models with perfectly transparent assumptions, good uh, empirical data, etc. But maybe a whole part of your results 
is uh, entirely driven by the specif this specific parameter. For example, in Equals 3, and the authors are uh, absolutely uh, intellectually honest. They say a whole, a whole a big deal of the results are linked to the elasticities of substitution, and more specifically, the elasticity of substitution is a production function, the CS, between capital and energy. Of course, if you can decrease your energy consumption uh, by uh, replacing it by uh, machineries without uh, energy, of course you can maintain a big uh, output uh, while uh, doing your energy transition. So, you need, there, there are lots of techniques like uh, runge keta 4 etc., in order to, 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 to see if a big part of your model is driven by parameters. Some, in some cases, it's desirable because you can say, okay, uh, uh, there, there are some tipping points or regime change if this parameter, for example, wage bargaining of workers in the Phillips curve, is uh, above or below this value. Uh, and about investment, you know, that's always a question, a supply model or demand model, I don't believe in this dichotomy. For me, I, I, I mean, it depends on the country. Some countries in some situated historical times can be demand driven. In some cases, if the capitalist uh, and investors are really strong in terms of capacity, etc., it can be profit led. So why not having both? Why not building a model that can have both according to the specific situation of the country in the specific period? For example, uh, you, you talked about post keynesian investment functions. You can have a beautiful Baduri-Marglin investment function, Baduri-Marglin model, where in the investment function is driven either by the profit share or the profit rate, so that the supply side, the, which is also the Marxist approach of uh, Marxist models like the Goodwin model originally, before the James model, it was driven by profit rate, uh, profit share, sorry, profit share. And uh, the other part of the Baduri marine function is the capaci uh, uh, capa capacity utilization rate, which is more the demand approach. Yeah, but the, the Zwarkin approach goes away with the demand uh, capacitization for the investment function. Yeah. It's only uh, exogenous, yeah. the autonomous demand. I'm not really into Zwarkin stuff. I, <laughs> I, I think that the, the most... The most it, it really changes the game on how the models... Can Absolutely. Because in, in, in that case, they, they have a... Every one of them has this capacitization, but in the, the Zwarkin ones, it's autonomous demand that are exogenous. Yeah. Uh, to the capacitization, because it, it, there's a lot of literature on, on this, but they, they go on and these could lead to very different results depending on this type okay. of function. It's not a parameter, because the, the, the neo, the post is a parameter space kind of problem, yeah. but this, this rocking critique is a different function for investment completely. Uh, Absolutely, and actually, in fact, in the, which is interesting with Strafian model is that it's a, one of the really rare and seldom non valrassian general equilibrium model, like the von Neumann model. In fact, uh, production of commodities by commodities, it's a model with, where the interest rate, uh, the real interest rate is not like the, the price of capital, etc., but you can see a bit like the, the rate which allows the self-reproduction of capital and production. In von Neumann, is that the same thing, so production about labor force. So in fact, it's a bit Marxist because it's about the reproduction of uh, factors of production, but I absolutely agree with you. In so, some paradigms or some sh functional forms or even some parameters can lead to, to diverse things. It's, it, it's why we need like a systemic comparison yeah. with also the same standardized database in order to avoid to have also econometric and estimation problems because you don't know, in fact, at the end of the day, what triggers the result. Because when you add, 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 add parameters, in fact, that's the Bellman uh, curse, you are in empty, empty spaces. Your face space, where you are 100, uh, 1000 dimensions, topologically, that's empty. So you have some uh, topological uh, approach in order to crush the, the empty dimension stuff, uh, with, uh, which are, enfin, the parameters which are linear combinations of other parameters, so you can reduce the dimensionality of, uh, of your face space, but that, that's, uh, yeah, there are ways to do that. Other questions? Oh, sorry, the maybe. Ah, yeah, of course. Biodiversity, in fact, uh, yeah, uh, in the criticisms in the paper uh, about the damage function, uh, we explicitly uh, uh, write that we need damage function not only about uh, climate, uh, climate uh, uh, warming or uh, energy consumption, but also all the other polycrisis uh, dimensions. So biodiversity, <laughs> decrease uh, like uh, physical resources extractions, decrease in heroes. 
uh, the risk of uh, anthropozoonosis, like COVID. If you deforest uh, places where humans have never been, but there, there is a non-trivial probability to uh, develop virus from animals to humans. I mean, the, absolutely, I totally agree. We need expanded damage functions. That's what, for example, is doing the page I am or the fund I am with really detailed damage functions. The issue is how do you estimate it? I think the, Bay the Bayesian estimation is, uh, is an interesting thing because, for example, for floodings, you, can you want to estimate a damage function for floodings. You have no information about this because it's not already happening, but you know the information on the places that are already touched by flooding. So you have a prior, a Bayesian prior, you know this information, and then you do a, Bayesian a hierarchical Bayesian estimation in order to try to generalize it. And each time there is a flooding, a new flooding somewhere due to climate warming, uh, you, can, uh, you, can, uh, you can adapt and adjust uh, the estimation. But of course, the damage function is really uh, like a man experiment. And in my opinion, you just need to try all the scenarios in order to be prepared also for the worst. Okay, ju just maybe we can take a few more questions uh, and you will try to. Okay. Make a, make a One answer for all the questions. Yeah. Um, hi, uh, I'm Karen. I'm from Austria. And thank you very much. I really like the presentation. Also, I do like models, but I also think that the biggest downside of them, as you already said, is that many people do not understand them. So I wanted to come back to the whole how you connect uh, actually the complexity of models that actually at least try or come close to depicting reality <laughs> in something like this very simple graph you draw, drew there. Uh, or if we would actually, like, is, do you think this is actually reconcilable for the models you were actually talking about, a simple graph like that? Or would you always need like interactive tools for people to understand them? And if we do need them, and that's the main question, if we do need always an interactive tool where like the majority of people can play around with and actually understand them, isn't there always like a huge lack in time between we have this new climate economic model and people actually understanding them. So doesn't the whole uh, democratic process is completely lost in that sense? Or am I, am I just pessimistic? I don't know. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm Max. I'm from Germany. And I wanted to ask like uh, whether you can imagine or whether you, you already know about like uh, models which estimate demand on a needs basis, not like on the basis of effective demand, money demand, but like on a needs basis. To estimate what? According the demand. To, as a demand. Yes, exactly. On, on a needs basis without money, <coughs> right? Which is not effective demand, but basically needs demand. Yeah, that's my question. Thank you. Uh, thank for the presentation. I'm um, I'm from Togo, West Africa. Uh, uh, my question was about uh, uh, structural analysis uh, mentioned by Talita in the present discussion. Uh, I want to ask uh, if wh what do you think about uh, builds uh, building a specific model for every country or region because of most of the model are uh, this general model uh, so. Uh, if I take, for example, uh, uh, GSC model, I cannot apply this model for my region or for my country, for example. So what do you think about uh, building specific model for every country? Like uh, what uh, 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 Professor, I don't know, Antoine Godin are doing uh, uh, last time for the joint seminar, he has shown some model specific for Maroc, uh, Colombia, something like that. Uh, so. Okay. Hello, um, I'm Sels, I'm Portuguese, and a um, very um, quick question here, and um, you, um, the, the central idea of your presentation was one of uh, we need to use better models, we can't use bad models. But I have a very big problem with models in general. And being economics and social science, what makes it very different, for, well, not, not the only thing, but one of the main differences it has from hard sciences is that our, our fundamental rules are shifting, are constantly shifting. And to me, this idea of trying to build bigger and uh, more complex and uh, more complex models seems to me a very chaotic uh, endeavor to try and get something that is effectively impossible to achieve, which then makes models one or two things, either their ideology or they are just uh, the plaything of the indolent mind. Uh, 
Um, Leonard from Germany, I have two very quick questions. Yesterday you mentioned that there was some kind of reaction from the users of the uh, models in, in the European Commission, I think, or in the DGs. If you would like to comment on that, I would be interested in that. And the second one uh, was that I'm impressed by the number of models that you have, seem to have, but like no, no, that you seem to know by heart. And I'm wondering whether you have some kind of methodology, some kind of approach that you can <laughs> share of <laughs> how to understand them that quickly and like how to have them all like um, ready to, to talk about them in detail. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I, f I don't think I can ah, yeah. answer that <laughs> OK, yes, really quickly. Uh, yeah, about uh, democracy and models. So of course, there is a way to integrate citizens to, way to, to do like, like uh, user-friendly models, but that's just one way. In other cases, you can have, a, as I put with the ABC, it's not a model, but it's a ta tax reform, but with three parameters, that are extremely effective to reproduce fiscal basis, etc. You can have a national debate on three parameters. Everyone can understand. By the way, my favorite model, so the, the one that Gail Giro used to build the gyms when he was at the AFD, the Goodwin model, it's just a two differential equation, a three differential equation if you add private debt. It's the weight share, the Phillips curve, so uh, employment rate, and so it's just like a, a model about the, uh, the class, uh, class conflict about the distribution of value between labor and between profit. You can add private debt. And once you have made ma those three equations, the point is, in fact, we have, uh, we have studied systematically all its property, topological property, mathematical property, etc. And then now we want to make it open source so that wh whatever government or teams of research in the world can use it and add, oh, I want to add gender inequalities, I will, I will add gender inequalities. Or I want to add uh, environment, I will add environment. So, is it, there is already a challenge even inside the research communities to make open source stuff in order to either to build on with uh, like uh, tools that we really master as a uh, you know small uh, low dimensionality and about democracy just uh, what i want from a model is not a normative uh, price for carbon tax what i want from a model is that if collectively we decide to have those goals or those trajectories what would be possibly the result so, in fact, I, w I want trajectories. I want narratives. I, I don't want perfect forecast. It's not possible. If, if I wanted a forecast, I would just run VAR, vector autoregressive, uh, uh, because there is literally autoregressive in the name. So, of course, ne no model can, can uh, beat a VAR at six months. After six months, there are regime changes, there are institutional stuff, there are social stuff happen. So, you, you cannot just uh, do that. But uh, what I want from a model is narratives in order to foster also uh, democratic uh, debates. I don't want uh, normative results. I want some heuristic, imperfect stuff in order to allow us, oh, okay, uh, let's talk about degrowth, but let's see maybe what are the potential impact of degrowth on underdeveloped countries if there is a global degrowth in order then to decide collectively uh, what, uh, how we would split the carbon, uh, the, like the, the carbon that left between poor countries, etc. That's heuristic, that tools among others to, uh, to, to feed the democratic uh, debate. About, uh, yeah, about all the changing rules, etc., uh, I totally agree. Uh, something which is interesting is that the more, the more realistic models, like the Goodwin models, etc., actually, they, co they correctly reproduced, for example, all the neoliberal, the, the, like the legacy of the neoliberal revolution of the 80s, 90s, with the like the, uh, like the decrease in wage share, for example, and the increase in unemployment, etc. So actually, there are models in social sciences. There are models in sociology. You don't need a mathematical model, by the way. You can have models like reductionist representation of the world without math in psychology, in logics, in philosophy. So just, just, just a... Model, basically. What? Just an heuristic model. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, in fact, if you really got my point, I'm, I'm not really about forecasting because there are regime changes. There are uh, neoliberal jobs acts which destroy labor laws and so the uh, bargaining power of workers. So you, you, and of course, then you can put uh, like a structural change, etc. But it's more about narrative, narratives of the different uh, possibilities in order to have a democratic debate. I don't want to, it's not possible. And I totally agree with you. It should always be 
uh, uh, co-built with, uh, with sociologists, with social scientists, uh, uh, even myself, I'm also trained to be a lawyer and a theologian, so I'm really into like uh, social sciences and also because if I only do modeling, I won't be able to, you know, to bring those models into reality, into democracy, into ethics. So uh, I totally agree with you. The only thing that I wanted to say is that mainstream economies that are hiding themselves from social questions, social sciences, ethical questions by saying, no, we are engineers, we are mathematicians. In fact, it's not even true because they use bad math. So it's not, it's not even true. Either you are a real social scientist and you, you, you do qualitative work, you, you talk about uh, ethics, etc., changing rules, etc., or you do real models. And, you do, and in both cases, you don't hide yourself from the democratic debate. You are not in the, like, uh, the kind of split, uh, split position, uh, if it answers your question. And uh, last, uh, yeah, uh, uh, not the last question, but uh, the, the, the one before. I, uh, I totally agree with you. Uh, in fact, uh, my first 10 years in life were spent in Madagascar in like a really small neo, uh, non-neo-colonial, non-white saver, but humanitarian framework. So in fact, I was really involved with all of this before reading books or Marx or being, doing economics because, uh, because, you know, that's just the international inequalities and uh, domination, uh, especially with France, you know, the, the France-Afrique, hein? in Madagascar, voilà, exactly. And still, the France CFA, the currencies of the CDAO, uh, etc., in Africa. So I totally agree with you. We shouldn't, in fact, that was, was doing the World Bank, you know, the Washington Consensus. We were building, we were, uh, um, uh, we were providing big reforms, big models, universal models to lots of underdeveloped countries. It led to the uh, Decada Perdida in uh, Latin America. It, led, it leads to, to lots of catastrophes. So, what, wa what was uh, Gail Giro doing when he was at the IFD for the James model, for example? You, you say that you have really a core model which, he, which seems to approach the really core dynamics of our market capitalist economies nowadays. And then, instead of just taking oh, uh, uh, Togo's data and pulling it through, you go to the country, you meet with the economists of the country, you do qualitative studies, field studies with sociologists, with anthropologists, and with local communities involved. You heard about their problems. You go into the villages to see what are, for example, the farmer behaviors, because the farmer behaviors in, Africa, uh, in, 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 uh, in Togo won't be the same as in South Africa, won't be the same as in France or in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Colombia. And then you adapt the functional forms and the model to the really anthropological and sociological and institutional specificities of this country with its regime change and structural changes. Because there are no universal models. Uh, the DSG is, you know, the, the, the parameters of the Phillips curve, so the, adapt the adaptation of uh, nominal wages to, uh, to, uh, to inflation, uh, that scale those parameters. That's the same. They are used in every DSG, that's the same. Like if the, the the tensions on labor market and union powers were the same in all countries in the world. No. Sorry, not sorry, I mean. So I, I totally agree with you also in terms of ethics, on um, uh, epistemic neocolonialism from white, uh, white savior scientists, etc. I totally agree with you. Re and thank you for bringing this aside because it was important in, in terms of ethics and uh, intellectual honesty. And fin uh, finally, uh, finally, uh, yeah, let's say that we, we, we are in discussions with, uh, with uh, European Commission's teams. Uh, of course, that, uh, that are, you know, we really try to say, to, not to, to, to be in the straw man sophism, to say that, yeah, uh, DSGs and mainstream models were the same than in the 70s, 80s. That's not true. We really show that uh, it have been lot, there have been lots of progress. Uh, we are not saying we need to replace those models. We are saying we want to bring complementary models that are working with research teams that are okay and that are wishing to work with you, but they are still quite... Uh, yeah, so there, there will be a big petition in a big, a big, uh, big, 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 uh, like a newspaper, a global newspaper in a, in a few weeks uh, signed by uh, hundreds and hundreds of economists to defend this paper. And uh, we will try to organize a joint seminar with the GRC and the different DGs of the European Commission in order, you know, to, to really foster communication and, uh, and uh, like... Um, the book is the first seminar of this paper, 
Yeah, absolutely. Common dialogue between mainstream and, uh, and others in order to foster a socially fair and stable ecology, ecological transition. And the last question about how do I do? I just uh, read a lot. <laughs> and uh, and that, but it's funny, but that's a really true. I mean, uh, I've been trained in really, uh, really neoclassical economics. So uh, I'm doing all the general uh, equilibrium, uh, convex compact set, and fixed point theorem, uh, like Akutani, Brewer, Haro de etc. You want uh, I mean, really the, the highest uh, stuff. Uh, but when you understand this, and when you, you start to tell yourself, maybe there is a discrepancy between those concepts those categories à la Vienna Circle and the reality, maybe you want to find something else. The issue is that there are no centralized resources. So in my case, uh, as uh, lots of you, I think, uh, I'm, I still have to, to find on GSTOR uh, uh, former papers of the 50s on the Cambridge controversy from Robinson, from Pattington. That's a huge loss of time. So indeed, we, we, need to, to, we need to build communities, human communities. We need to build common resources, common textbooks. Uh, Graceli and Giro will, uh, are about to public, uh, to, to, to publish a textbook on uh, like uh, endogenous uh, modeling. I, I'm currently writing with them, uh, uh, and Judith Clement, uh, uh, a book on uh, how general equilibrium theory internally dismiss the invisible hand of Smith, and not the opposite. So yeah, we need to produce resources. We need to build human communities. And for the last thing, which is doing research or doing activism or trying to change things into a world which is extremely violent, even emotionally, in terms of confrontations, of neoliberalisms, etc., on our bodies, etc., lots of inequalities, of gender violence, uh, whatever. We need those human communities also to resist that, not to feel alone in our lab or NGO uh, thinking that no, nobody uh, wants uh, the, desire, uh, the, the future that we desire, but we need also solidarity even between researchers. Thank you for your listening.